We're going to go ahead and get started here. Welcome again to Demystifying the Anatomy of an Impactful Resume, featuring Zoe Glass, UX researcher at Lyft. This event is hosted by SDXD, San Diego Experience Design Professionals Network. My name is James, and I'm the president. We're a community globally of 4,600 UX practitioners who gather regularly to connect, inspire, and learn. Big shout out to my fellow organizers, couldn't do it without you. And also a massive thanks to our event sponsor, MetaLab. I'll hand it off to Taylor Authors, marketing specialist at MetaLab to tell you more about this incredible company. Thanks so much, James. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor. Uh, I work at MetaLab, as James said, we're the proud sole sponsor of SDXD. Um, a bit about MetaLab, so we're born in Canada, based everywhere. We are actually based, um, our headquarters are in a tiny um, town on Vancouver Island, but we actually have 140 folks all across the world, so we're very remote central. Um, where a lot of agencies claim to be full service and do everything for everybody, we know what we do. We do product and we do it really well. So over the years, we've shipped over 215 products. So that averages to be about 21 a year. And we've had 14 years honing our craft. Um, so some of our clients include Slack, Google, um, most recently Headspace and The Athletic. Um, being a remote first team, we, we deal with all the favorite tools. So Zoom, Notion, Figma are some of our favorites. And the plug, we are hiring. So we're looking for product professionals in a capacity of different roles. So if you guys are interested, you can head over to metalab.com slash careers. We're looking for a product manager and a researcher. So a bunch of exciting roles up and we'd love to work with you. So give us a shout. I'll hand it back over. Thank you so much, James. Much appreciated. A little bit about tonight. We're gonna have a great presentation, interactive workshop and Q and A. Followed by that, there will be some exciting optional post-event networking. And just to incentivize participation a little bit, if you come on camera and share or write an answer to one of our exercise questions in the chat, you will be entered in a raffle to have an exclusive one-on-one -on -one session with tonight's featured speaker, Zoe. So please do participate. Now, more about Zoe Glass. She currently leads research for Lyft's new rentals product. She started her UX career at YouTube and prior to that received her BS from the University of Montana and MS from Purdue University. She's long been an ardent researcher of human behavior, but made the zag into UX in the past four years. Previously, Zoe focused on conservation behavior studying things like how religion and living areas affect willingness to conserve wildlife. In her spare time, Zoe enjoys mentoring others, looking to make the jump into UX, competitive cycling, and hiking with her very famous corgi, Fletcher. So without further ado, let's give a warm, warm, warm SDXD welcome to Zoe Glass, tonight's incredible speaker for demystifying the anatomy of an impactful resume. Thanks again, Zoe. The stage is all yours. James, I need you to intro me in all of my life. I think my like self-love and ego would increase dramatically. Deal. Uh, let me just share my screen. Did I share the wrong thing? I definitely did. Oh, sorry about that. We definitely practiced this and it decided not to work. Don't worry, I've only done this thousands of times in the last year, enough to be very nervous doing it for you all. Awesome. Okay, I think we're there. Thank you for your patience. 
So James already gave me an amazing introduction, but yes, um, I studied wildlife biology, um, which I think is one of the big reasons people often like to talk to me, which is like, hey, how the heck did you end up here? Um, my undergrad specifically was in wildlife. I studied actually the reproductive habits of birds. And then in my master's, I, I switched just a little bit to look at the human dimensions of wildlife or how we can manage humans such that they can manage wildlife. And I think you can start to see like, okay, that's getting closer to UX, but still pretty far from that. Which is why when I talk about my career path, I don't really call it so much a career path It's just, this is how I ended up here. So I actually worked as a wildlife biologist for a while, um, published a fair bit, spent summers basically hiking around in the middle of nowhere and um, looking at things like teeth, dentition and bears. Um, so not at all what I'm doing now. And then I decided I needed to move back to California and did some PR, um, which is just trying to get companies' attention, really honed in my communication skills, which has served me very well. And I strongly encourage you to lean into communications. And then was a social scientist for the state, um, looking at how we can increase hunting and fishing. So really looking at fun behavioral attitudes and finally made my way into UX. So why do I share this with you in such detail? A lot of people that I talk to are like, oh, I'm making some huge jump from psychology into UX or from design to research or, or similar. There is definitely room for you in this field. And I swear if I can go from studying possums to here, you can definitely make this leap. So I'm excited to chat with you today about how you can use your resume to tell the world that you are ready to make these leaps, ready to make the leap to the next position, the next level, whatever your goals are. So a couple of rules of engagement. If you have questions, please let me know as we go. Um, don't feel like you have to hold on to them at the end. James will pop in and interrupt me as they come through the chat, but please let me know. Don't feel like you have to hold on. Uh, if it's further in the presentation, I'll say, hey, it's further in the presentation and I'll get to it in a bit. If you disagree with me, let me know. This is also one of the amazing things about research is we have this huge opportunity to make things better by having conversations. So if you disagree or something doesn't make sense, if something else, let me know. If it feels like it's totally out of scope, um, we won't go into it too deeply. And if it's something else, please just send me a LinkedIn or send me an email. It's here. We'll be sharing the recording of this as well as the PDF of the document. So reach out. If you choose to connect on LinkedIn, send me a note on why you want to connect or I will reject it. James will be laughing in just a second. The last time I presented, I said this three times and 50% of people still sent me a LinkedIn request with no text in it, which I will reject. And you'll be sad and I'll be sad because I lost out on the opportunity to connect with you. But please, please, please send a note. Okay, so let's get into it. What the heck is impact? Impact is really our opportunity to show the world what we pulled off, right? What did we make as researchers and what came of the research we did? Now, specifically, I want to say that's the result of your work. Now, why it mattered is what you can tell the world in something that is beyond it. So if you found out that most Americans love dogs, that's actually not much of a finding, right? Or it is just a finding. How you then use that to leverage a product decision to make a new dog Fitbit collar, to get more adoption centers, whatever that piece is, that's the impact. The actual finding isn't there. So focus in on throughout this presentation, excuse me, on, on that, why it mattered. How are you going to tell the world why it mattered? How can you convince the world that it mattered? And I promise if it's really technical, you're off the bat, right? You're not here to prove to me that you can do research. You're here to prove to me that you can do good research and impactful research. Let's get a little bit more specific though, because I'm sure you're sitting there being like, okay, Zoe, thanks. That's the least helpful advice I've ever heard. So let's get more technical. It's a verifiable way that your work influenced someone else, another team, an organization, product, operations, marketing, or a strategy. In other words, don't box yourself in too far. Especially when I talk to new people, they say, I don't know what work my work did. I just started here. Okay but it still led somewhere. So you're just showing me that you know where it led, that there was a reason you did your research at all or design or whatever else. I'm a researcher, so deal with my bias. So we generally say that there's three areas that you could make impact. I think this is really important. So if you're taking notes, start taking notes now. It's not just product. It's a piece of it, but it's not always. 
Impact can simply be that something was really, really hard. This could be strategy, figuring out how to get your team aligned on something, getting them ready to play the game, getting them bought in. It could be that it was just really technically difficult. Most of engineering impact actually comes through this, right? This problem was sticky and hard, and I was up against a lot internally to make it happen. It could be in methods that you're using. If you decided that, let's say, you had to keep doing design and research in a pandemic, that's difficulty, that's impact. You still showed impact despite the card situation that you were in. Maybe you took on a new method. Maybe you started working with kids or protected populations, which are much harder to work with, but you still got something good out of it. That's huge impact, right? Politics, things are hard internally. Anybody who's had their first job in UX knows that you might have the best job or the best idea in the world, and nobody wants to listen to you because somebody tried it three years ago or somebody's manager doesn't like it, overcoming those difficulties is huge impact. So if it's just tough. Now this is the more traditional one. And I think this is what we think of when we think of impact. And yes, it's important, but it's one of three. So don't over index on it. But these are things like more people started using my product. I made it easier to use. I increased revenue, accessibility. All of those like kind of sexy, easy metrics, yes, they're definitely impact. Lean into those if you have them. If you don't though, you're safe. You've got these other two. And the last one is leadership. Now, what's leadership? That could be actually managing others, mentoring others, creating a new method or using method in a new way that then other people start to use. Maybe you developed a new process for your organization. Like, I absolutely love Lyft. There's some random processes that just weren't in place when I got there. Put those into place, they're pretty easy. That's leadership, right? Um, creating consensus. Is your team really disagreed? Have they been fighting over this thing for three months and you led a sprint and they agreed? Even if the product never got made, even if it didn't go anywhere, you got consensus, that's leadership. To bring politics back in, if you can manage those politics and get people to the table to talk to each other, that's huge. Thought leadership, um, that's actually even things like this. Me talking to you today is thought leadership, pushing things into your organization or setting a high bar for excellence. If you're really good at something and you get to hold other people to that bar, if you're an amazing surveyor and you're making sure that nobody shares a survey with a really bad sample size, you can set that bar for others and use that as ways to show impact. But next, look at some examples of that because I know that's still hard. What might a tough problem look like? These are things like I delayed a launch of a new feature due to lack of accessibility, despite pressure from the CEO. This happens a lot in tech. So if accessibility is your game, know that a lot of your impact is probably gonna come from tough problems. People are going to want to launch things that are not ready to launch. And you as a UXer, the person who's fighting for the user, while everyone else is fighting for money and time and launch and OKRs, you're still fighting for the user. You're winning sometimes by going against the rest of the crowd, right? I don't care that we were really supposed to launch this Wednesday. We can't because we don't meet these guidelines. That's tough problems. Um, developing some new program that is then used by other teams, right? I realized that we couldn't assess launch readiness easily. And I coded something or I created something that made it easier to check that. And that decreased things for everybody else. That's really hard to do. And even though it's outside of the sphere of just your product area, it's very impactful because you overcame a tough problem. Product impact, yes, yes, these are the sexy ones, the easy ones. Increased revenue by 11%, it's easy, great. Um, generated something that then came up somewhere else, right? Maybe your little baby insight that you loved um, or your product change that you loved gets mentioned by a CEO in a presentation or is used by someone else, that's product impact, even if it wasn't directly with your work. And finally, leadership, right? I mentored people and they got jobs. I mentored people and they got pay raises. Um, I led a workshop here, right? These are all the things that you might be doing that you're not actually counting towards your work. Think of your product area definitely as the key driver for your impact, but everything that you do that's UX related, um, the workshops that you attend, that you help put on, those can all potentially be leadership. James, do we have any questions yet? Cool. Awesome. Okay. 
where is the, where is this stuff? I think this is also where people tend to struggle, especially early in career, because we overly focus on that product. So there's a bunch of different levels of where we can actually have this. The first, of course, is that individual project. I'm going to use a bunch of examples today from Lyft Rentals because that's what I work on, which, by the way, you can now rent cars from Lyft. You should do it. Thank you. Um, if my product specifically just affected that thing, right? I found an issue with insurance, so we changed the way that we named it for clarity. That could be impact. The product area is one step further, right? No longer just one piece, just insurance, but the team as a whole. Both of these are pretty common. The next is maybe the structure of your organization is a little bit potentially different than ours, but the way it works at Lyft is we have my team that sits within something called fleet. And then there's four lines of business. Rideshare is the one that you've heard of or driver fleet. And then we have our autonomous, right? So each of those, I might just be impacting other things in fleet. Um, fleet involves rental cars for drivers, uh, the platform product and mine. So a little bit broader than my team, but not for all of Lyft. Then it might just be cross role. So throwing out that org chart entirely, like impacting all of design or all of research or all of engineering, a lot within those like leadership and difficulty settings. Then maybe outside of traditional roles, right? Um, all of rideshare, all of marketing, getting into those bigger buckets. And finally, all the way across your company and then beyond your company. So that might be your work. It also might be more of your volunteer work and mentorship. But there's a bunch of different times to think about that leadership. The further that you get from that individual product level, the harder it is to say, I am directly responsible for that, right? Let's take, for example, I did some research on insurance that was then used by another team, and then that team saved money. When it comes to UX, I get to take credit for the fact that that team made money because they used my work. So start thinking much bigger. Um, I think this is particularly difficult for UXers because we tend to be highly empathetic. They also tend to be high performers. High performers often don't like to take credit for their work or tend to be more negative on yourself than you are positive and you're less likely to take credit for those things. So throw that out the window, start to take credit. Okay, let's get into the meat of this. Why does this all matter? I've just given you a bunch of stuff. Again, we'll share the deck. Impact is our opportunity to actually prove that research, that design, that engineering did something beyond us. It's the bridge between what we did and why we did it. It's making that very clear connection for others as they look at our resumes, our portfolios, and our work. Now, if we were to think of academia on this scale from UX for the sake of UX to UX for the sake of business, Academia is closer to that UX for the sake of UX, right? We try to come up with things that work for everyone. Rules, research, ideas that almost any company, any user could go in and adopt and start to use it for themselves. UX for the sake of UX. This is how we make chairs more ergonomic. This is how we make sure filing cabinets don't tip over. Things of that nature. But when it comes to tech, we actually don't care if it works for anyone else. We're inherently very selfish. I work for Lyft. I do not want my product to work for Uber. Um, we're trying to create our own special little unicorns that work best for our companies for the sake of the business, which also means that we can't just say, I did really cool research. Look how amazing my research was because unfortunately it doesn't matter. It only matters if it benefits the business. We'll talk about this more because I know that it can be painful to hear for the first time. Now, UX for the sake of UX often looks like things like writing a paper. Well, for the sake of business, it's increasing revenue, increasing use, those kind of more traditional product aimed things. Now, again, this kind of sucks. At the end of the day, you exist to make the company money. That's capitalism, baby. It sucks, but it is where we are. Um, maybe for some of you, it doesn't suck, but I'm gonna put my own opinion on here because I can. Um, any work that you do exists to make the company more money, more accessible, more people using it. Now you might be pissed about this, which I'd understand because you'd say, wait, I do a lot of really cool things that don't directly have to do with money or indeed might make the company less money. I worked on focus mode for YouTube 
which decreased watch time. That's an anti-metric for YouTube. So how did I make sure that that was still impactful work? You just have to tell me why it does matter for the company. And this, again, I'm pushing you outside of these traditional product metrics and into those difficulty and leadership metrics. So there's a bunch of different ways to make impact. Now, these things could be things like collaborating with others, leading a working group, improving accessibility. Yes, I've over harped on this one, but please, as you go out into the world, make sure your products are accessible. Um, hosting an offsite with your friends, getting people outside of the office just to enjoy each other a little bit more once we're all vaccinated. Mentoring, talking to others, oops, and design changes. Those are the more traditional ones. But regardless, you still have to have this bridge of why that matters for the business's success. And that's the impact, right? So what do we mean by that? We can say things like increase the targetable market by 2% by improving accessibility to meet A11Y, which is accessibility for anybody that doesn't know this term. The piece that we did, the piece that I see most on resumes is, well, I improved accessibility. That's a thing that you did, but you're not actually telling me why it matters, right? Why you did it, why it mattered and why you did it is it increased that targetable market, right? Yes, there's plenty of reasons to increase accessibility, but you inherently, for the sake of the business, got more people to use the product. The latter is the outcome. The first part is the impact. And only in the middle is that measured by. Remember when we talked about, it's gotta be measurable in some way. It doesn't have to have a figure, but yes, it does make it easier when there is one. Similarly, you could say decrease time to launch for Q3 projects versus Q2 by increasing cross-functional collaboration. On resumes, I see all the time, I cross-functionally collaborate and I work with design and PM and everybody else and how great is that? By itself, that actually doesn't matter, right? There's some people that are really great at working with others but not great at following through. So what you're showing me with the impact is that you collaborated for a reason. And that reason was that you decreased time to launch or you got the product out. You decreased frustration, increased employee satisfaction scores. You can pull data from all sorts of different places, but there has to be a why you did it. It can't just be that you collaborate. Reduce technical debt by 12% by establishing better prioritization protocols. Again, better prioritization protocols, that's the outcome. The impact is that it increased technical debt. Technical debt, for those who don't know, Every time we launch something, it probably has technical debt. If you work at a company that has no tech debt, like please message me and tell me how. But we commit to basically launching things knowing that we're going to have to fix them after launch. The more you can reduce that, the more time you save because nobody likes to actually go back and fix tech debt. But still, you're telling me right, right? Why? It doesn't matter that you made better protocols. It only matters that you made better protocols because it did something for the company. Okay, now you're, I wanna share in a couple that are just like kind of fun, right? You might host a painting class. I think these are things that people leave off their resumes all the time, but if you're the person who looks to make sure that your team gets together and bakes or paints or has a game night, there are still ways to mention this on your resume. You increase team morale, boosting productivity. How are you gonna measure that? Who knows? Nobody cares but you're telling me why you did it. And that's enough on its own, right? You have an understanding that you didn't just host a painting class for the sake of hosting a painting class. You hosted it because it helped others do their job better. Even if it's in kind of this more nebulous way, you can definitely include these kinds of things as long as the impact is there. Now you might still be saying, wait, okay, come on Zoe doing accessibility work, collaborating with others, finding something really cool. That's so obvious. Why do I need to connect it in this way? Why do I need to explain it in this way? If I say I improved accessibility, that should be enough. And unfortunately, it's just not. Um, Brittany, when she, when she shared this event, I really liked that she pulled this, but like good UX is not the same as impactful UX. You might have done an amazing job calling out issues with accessibility as a researcher and said, these are all the things we need to fix and this is why we need to fix them. But if nobody listened to you, if nothing actually changed in the product, what you did was good UX. But 
it didn't actually change anything, which when it comes to research makes you a bad researcher, which I know can be painful to hear because sometimes it's outside of your control. But we want to show the world that when it is within our control, we can push for those changes to actually follow through. And I think I, I see this a lot of when people transition from academia to tech. Academia is much more perfection oriented. Everything's done to 100%. You have things that are peer reviewed. When they go out into the world, they're pretty polished and perfect. Tech is an 80% world. What do I mean by that? Nothing you do is gonna be perfect. Everything is to meet the deadlines that the organization has, which means whenever a design is ready to design and engineering is ready to code, you better be ready because they're gonna code anyway. And if you're waiting for perfection along the way, they're gonna code without your research, without your design, and things aren't gonna go very well. So what you're telling me when you say, I improve, increase the number of users because of accessibility, is that you one, understand why you did the work that you did, but that you made sure that it mattered to your team and that your team was able to follow through on it. And that's what really makes and separates strong researchers and strong designers from people that are, tend to be just starting out. But what's great about that is once you know this formula, which I hope you will by the end of tonight, you're gonna get that job because this is all we're looking for. We're not looking for you to make methodologically perfect. We're just looking for you to know why you're doing the work you did so that you can be a good teammate and make sure that it makes money for the company. Why not? And then to jump into this further, like you might've done the work at the wrong time. You might've used the wrong users. This actually happens more than you'd think. You might not have considered team needs. You might've been really, really excited about some side project and your team is sitting there going, great, but I need to launch this thing and I'm gonna launch it. Uh, so you didn't take into account what they wanted or how they were looking. Uh, constraints, time, money. These are the ones you're gonna get hit with most often. You might've just turned it in too late and they've already moved on. Or you might've presented it in a way that nobody listened. Um, different teams are motivated by different things. Different people on your team are motivated by different things. So as a good designer and a researcher or a UXer, you have to be able to take into account what other people are going to respond to when you present this to others. I constantly say we're just as much politicians as we are UXers. Which is all to say that your job is not just to do good work. Yes, please do good work. Do your methods correctly, follow through, take into account your users, but it's also to make it things work better for the company, your product and its users, which requires that it's gotta be impactful, which is why impactful resumes get more jobs. Now let's get into a little bit more detail. Why is impact important to you, people here in the room? This is gonna be the rest of your life. Yes, it matters for resumes and that's what we're focusing on today, but it's also really important for portfolios. I see hundreds of portfolios on the web that are beautiful, stunning works of art that are just very detailed lists of what they did. I interviewed eight people and I found this and, I, and then this. That's actually not what we're looking for in a portfolio. We're looking for impact. We're looking for that why. Can you explain to me your process and how you came to a resolution and what that resolution did? Those are the portfolios that get hired just as much as these are the resumes that get hired. And finally, if you haven't already learned this yet, tech is really obsessed with performance reviews, um, which is basically how we evaluate one another. This is, as far as I can tell, pretty novel to tech, but once to twice a year, you will have to do what's called an impact statement where you say everything that you did and why it was so important to your team, the organization, et cetera. And those impact statements determine how much money you make if you get promoted or not, if you get to manage or not, they're very impactful for the rest of your career. So get through it now, become a pro at it now, and it's going to serve you really, really well for the rest of your life. Well, rest of your life in UX anyway. Um, so that's that performance rating. Generally, those are on a five point scale, raises, promotions, even going on to your next company, they're gonna wanna see these kind of things. Um, this is how a lot of people are able to jump levels when they change companies or significantly jump pay grades. James, do we have any questions popped in yet? 
We actually have a few and they're they're quite juicy. Ooh, so, love it. Let's go. All right. So we have one from Amy and it's how do I fit all this information into a resume without turning it into a small novel? Is there a rule of thumb on how many pages you recommend a resume should be? Yes, love this question. Thank you, Amy. Um, here's the thing. A resume is a hook. We're gonna use a fishing analogy here because I like to fish. It is not a full description of what you do. Each job should have no more than five lines, five bullet points. Really each bullet point should fit on a line. Um, I think our temptation, especially when we're new, is kind of this desperate need to prove to the world that we're good enough. Please take a risk on me. I'm really great and I just wanna prove it to you. But here's the kind of the dirty secret of the industry. The hiring manager and the recruiter are looking at hundreds of resumes when we have jobs and we're gonna spend between 30 seconds and a minute on your resume. So even if you wrote a small novel, it would never get read. So it's much better to keep things short so I would write out all of your impact statements that we work on today and then choose the top five. Those should be the juiciest ones, the best ones, or the ones that show the greatest breadth of your work relative to the job that you're applying for. In terms of rules of thumb, if this is your first job in UX, the one page rule does apply. Um, there's definitely variation hiring manager to hiring manager. I I have nothing wrong with two page resumes, but I also love career switchers. So I spend a while looking at people's resumes. I have a lot of other managers who do not look at resumes that are longer than a page. So I think the, the trade off really is like, either they don't look at it at all or you get the one person who really will and it's better to be safe and just go shorter. But again, it's not an exhaustive list of who you are and what you can do. It's just enough for them to call you and say, hey, Amy, can we have a call with the recruiter? And the recruiter is then going to go through your resume with you and ask you a bunch of questions about the role. And then you get to talk to the manager. And at that point, your resume really is no longer the considering factor at all. It's going to be your presentation that you give on site and the interviews that you go through. So it's just the hook. Don't feel like everything has to be in there. Then a related question from Stephanie, given the resume as a hook, what's the relationship and how does it work in tandem with a cover letter? Mm. So I will say the first time I applied for a UX job and it was at YouTube, I sent the cover letter to Rob Yeomans who heads UX for the Zurich team for YouTube now. And he wrote back, LOL, haven't seen a cover letter in years. Um, and he gave me the job. So <laughs> I think cover letters, especially if you're career transitioning, give you a little bit of space to say, hey, like this is why this work is more relevant. As long as it's impact focused though, within your resume, it's really not as important. Uh, why is that? It's actually much harder to teach people to be impactful than it is to teach them to be good researchers. So we're more willing to take risks on people that clearly show impact, but maybe still need to work on one or two skills to really polish and get there. Um, do you think that answers that, James? I guess not. Like, I don't know. Do a cover letter if you want. It might not get read. Not everyone's using them anymore. Sorry. Right on. Yeah, <laughs> that's Tessa's follow-up is if it's optional, should we take a time to write one or not? It's very optional. If you're going to write one, it really should be like two paragraphs or less. Um, very to the point. Here's what I can bring to your company. Um, Honestly, you'd be better served to just try and find the recruiter and directly reach out or try and find the hiring manager and directly reach out or get a, refer a referral with the caveat of please know the person you're asking to refer you. Um, if I know you well enough to actually make a referral, I can write a cover letter on your behalf. That's like, this is why Stephanie would be so amazing. Yes, her background is non-traditional or yes, her background is really traditional and this is why it's so great. And I, the recruiter's more likely to read that because that person's already within the company. Um, if they just happen to refer you because there's some random person that you found online or gosh forbid that website that you like pay people to refer you, it's not actually gonna help you. So don't go through those routes. Very insightful. Thanks for that. And a 
follow up from Amy is, if I have 15 years worth of UX experience, how many previous positions should I list? Should I refer the employer to a LinkedIn page for the full list? So now I'm creating too many pages in my resume? You know, I think if you have 15 years, you're, you're pretty senior. Um, so at that point, I'm really less worried about your resume being multiple pages. Uh, in terms of visual design, make it really clear which parts are which. Like I, I assume that you have publications and presentations in there as well. Separate those out in a really clear way. Um, I think going to like routing to a LinkedIn is fine, but they're only going to do that if they're already very interested in you. So it's probably a bigger risk. Um, I would include probably the like five to six jobs that are most important. Again, still probably not more than five lines per position, which can be really difficult, but it, it's just enough to get them interested. But 15 years, I feel like also lean into your network the rest will get you a job somewhere just by talking. Yeah. Sina has a great question asking, what's the best way to highlight the value of UX on your resume if some of the work you've done is confidential? And then Maria has a related question, or if you have the metrics, but you can't state them for NDA reasons. Totally. So this is a great question for, for a couple of reasons. Um, and I'm gonna just throw in one thing quickly, which is this also applies to portfolios. Um, one of the things we're looking for when you're applying is that you can respect an NDA. So it's really not a bad idea at various points to say, oh, I can't talk about that, it's under NDA. Because you're showing me that you respect your current employer or former employer's NDA, and then you are very likely to accept, to respect ours. Um, in terms of the metrics, this is where we start to get into things. You can say like, significantly increased, improved, things of that nature. Uh, we understand that things are under NDA. Uh, everybody else applying is under the same constraints. So I think it's probably just less of a concern than you think it might be. Um, if anybody asks point blank though, hey, that's under NDA, I can't talk about that. Or I can only talk about that in vague terms. If the project itself is completely under NDA, which I've dealt with, um, you still do have options, especially on the portfolio end of things. I once gave a talk about a, a project I literally couldn't even name and talked about it in the most vague terms completely, um, or most vague terms possible. You're still explaining to me why you took the steps you did. Like at this point, I faced a legal barrier because I was working with a protected group. Therefore, I did this, this, and this, or these were the risks that I faced. These were the concerns you can actually still really explain why you're impactful without talking about the specifics um, if you can't talk about it at all. But hopefully you also have other projects with the company that you can talk about. And I think our temptation is to like stick with our really sexy, juicy project. That actually can be really hard for a resume because it's difficult to boil those sexy, juicy projects down to a single line. So sometimes those smaller projects can be easier to include anyway. So I would think of like, Am I still showing impact? Am I still showing that bridge? And if I am, you could probably use one of those less sexy projects. We've got a question from Nicole and it says, I heard from a recruiter not to use adjectives like significantly, dramatically, notably. So how should I express qualitative metrics or perhaps quantitative metrics without actual figures. Yeah, so the piece here is making sure it still has impact. I'm not against adjectives. I think what I see a lot is when people say significantly improved collaboration, but you haven't actually shown me what that impact was, right? What you wanna say is significantly decreased time to launch because of collaboration skills. That's okay where it's when it's just too vague, like, okay, I don't even know what it means to have significantly increased it. What was the outcome? Why does it matter? So I think the recruiter might've overstepped, at least in my opinion, and, and people have different opinions on this, but might've overstepped and saying, don't have them at all, but have them connected to impact. Don't just, the impact cannot just be the one thing. It's always connecting to something else. I feel like that's not the most straightforward way to say that. So let me try that again. Um, to take a really silly example, 
right? I wouldn't say significantly increase the number of walks I take my dog on, but I might say significantly increased health outcomes by increasing his amount of exercise. Again, that impact the bridge. Why should I care? Because I increased his lifespan. The walks themselves being more really isn't important. Yes. Anika's asking if your impact showed that use revenue increased. How do you prove that it was UX that created that positive effect as opposed to other factors? Yeah, so here's the thing, it doesn't matter. Uh, we enable things that are way far down the line. By way of example, last year I figured out that one of our, one of the ways that we talked about a piece of our product was really unclear to users. And therefore, no matter how cool this thing was, it wasn't actually making them pick up their rental car. So what did we do? I worked with marketing and marketing developed copy that then addressed this in the confirmation screen and on the post email. So once you booked a rental car, you got an email that had this emphasized. And that marketing email did StatSig increase the number of people that picked up their cars. Really what made the change was marketing, but marketing only knew to make the change because of UX. So when I talked about that work, what I would say is StatSig increased number of reservations after identification of issues with perk stickiness, right? The piece in the middle that marketing handled things that really isn't important in terms of impact. Um, when you're talking about your portfolio piece, you do want to talk about the path all the way through, but in terms of the impact, you don't need to, you just don't need to. Um, and get more comfortable taking credit for the ripple effects of your work, like throw the pebble in the pond, the ripple that's 90 feet away still was caused by your pebble, even though it's now very distant from it and was caused by the other ripples along the way. Fantastic. I believe you're about to delve into this, but I'll read this question just so we have it out there. Jessica's asking, what if you're a student and want to get into a UX co-op position, but you have no real experience in UX? Yeah. How would you highlight current design work that you have to show employees that you do have that potential despite lacking that experience? Totally. So we'll get into this actually right now. I have seen brilliant UX resumes from people who work at makeup counters, from people who worked in fast food, who worked in really roles that you would not consider directly leading to UX. As long as you can show me that impact, you're still good. Like let's, let's take this makeup counter example. What you're doing at the counter when you're selling it is taking into account people's needs, what they've told you, what you see that you may or may not be able to share with them. Like maybe you notice something that you're like, oh, maybe they want to address that, but they're not mentioning it or they don't know that it's something that can be addressed. You're understanding their budget. You're understanding how much time they have in the morning to do their makeup. All of these are UX research factors, right? That you can then take and make into a product recommendation for this person. So you can still talk about that job in terms of impact because you're taking data and turning it into something and, and selling it. Um, so even student roles, as long as you can show me that you understand why you did the research you did or why you did the design that you did, and then what could have come of it, it's gonna be just as, yeah, just as good. So we'll jump into this section now and then James, I'll take it back to you at the next break. Um, the pro tip here is don't wait until the end to figure it out. I think one of the things I see with student projects a lot is we just do it because it's there, right? I did the project because I was told I needed to do a design project. Make sure you have a design reason going into any of your projects. They don't need to be real, right? You don't need to be working with that company, but let's say you're going to redo an artist's website. You have to have some clear sense of like, well, I know their website doesn't work very well, or I know based on their Instagram that they struggle with sales, whatever that might be, that you know something going in. Um, I was looking at one recently, a design portfolio project and they were like, I made a dating app, but they had no reason to have made that dating app. Um, or their reason was like, it doesn't exist. And I Googled it and found four apps that do the thing that they were proposing. So make sure, don't do it just for the sake of doing it. Um, give yourself a reason. 
So you should really only be doing research and design that should have impact. Uh, once you get into these roles, and yes, it says research. I'm a researcher, I apologize. Uh, you're going to be asked to do way more work than you could ever do. Uh, this is on the right, a prioritization exercise that I do with my team once and a half. They requested 63 weeks of research in a 25 week period. Even if I worked 80 hours a week, I couldn't get that done. And I'd be emotionally exhausted. And frankly, I really like to do things outside of work. And I don't like working 80 hours. And Lyft doesn't ask me to. Little plug for Lyft there. It's a great company to work for. So you're really only going to want to prioritize the work that has the potential to make the biggest change. There's always going to be people that want to make things and design things and research things that really don't have any change that you're like, okay, great. Well, what if I find that that's completely broken? Do we have the engineering to fix it? If you don't, don't do the research, don't do the design because nobody can use it. So questions to consider in that, do you have the engineering design product fiscal support to make the changes that you find or make the designs that you propose? If you find X, is Y feasible? If I wanted to get rid of this entirely, can I actually do that? Or is this a waste of my time? How many people does this affect? I do want to caveat this question. There are some things that just do not affect many people. For example, accessibility for the blind affects a lot fewer people than making sure your gaming app works. That's still something that's very important to do. It should be considered a baseline goal. But if you're thinking like, do I want to improve my insurance offering for business and business is only 30% of my users and people who book insurance is only 7%, it's probably not the highest prioritization because it just doesn't affect that many people. Could this change other parts of the org, right? Maybe it doesn't affect many of your users, but if you do it successfully, it could affect other people in your company. That's something also to consider. How could this researcher design benefit other teams or other groups if you're allowed to share it publicly? And what timeline constraints exist, right? Can I actually get this done in the amount of time I have? So your job as a UXer is to say no a lot. Say no to the wrong things and yes to the right things. Defend your time, defend yourself. We are getting back to the student question, I promise. Uh, value yourself, please, please, please. I see so much burnout in first, second and third year UXers because they feel like they can't say no to things. And they're like, my manager asked me to do 10 things. Your manager brought 10 things to your attention. It's up to you to pick the two that you can actually do. So how do you show it? with this I'm being new. You really first wanna to get to the root of why you did it. This like, why, 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 why? Yes, this is what we tell toddlers or we ask toddlers to stop telling us, but it's really important. And I think one of my favorite examples of this recently, I was mentoring someone who is gonna be spectacularly talented and I'm really excited for them. But they were telling me the story of how they took a class in VR design and they were so good that somebody hired them within the school. And like, they were like, that's my impact. Somebody wanted to hire me. Yeah, okay, like, I, I don't know if that's good or not. Maybe you were their only option. Maybe they had no idea what VR was and they didn't know what good was. So let's push in all those whys to make something that's better than because I was hired. Why would I present science in VR? Well, because if science is really, really, really difficult to access, why? Here's our second why. Um, because it tends to be pay gated, but it also tends to be written in language that's only for scientists, at least on the cutting edge, right? Those papers that are written. So why is it important to get over that? Because we need to make science more accessible. When we take longer to reach our participants, to reach the average user, the impact of that science decreases dramatically, or in some cases isn't used at all. And that impact for the scientists becomes zero. Why does that matter? because we want people to be able to do this, right? So when her impact actually is increasing the accessibility of science information and overcoming systematic barriers of income and education. And that's way sexier and way more powerful than I got hired, right? But it's the exact same work. So just keep asking a why, and this is one, she didn't increase the product use, like more people using it. There was nothing under NDA. She didn't tell me what the science was. All she's showing me is that she increased it by using this novel method showing that leadership, showing that difficulty, and showing that product impact. So ask why a whole bunch of times. Don't worry, I forgot this slide was in here. So 
you might not have those metrics when you're new. That's really okay. They will come. I just want to see the bridge, right? The connection between what you did and what the outcome was, right? Let's say you just did an audit when your class because you really wanted to and you did an audit of LinkedIn and you were like, oh, LinkedIn should really have a mark is unread feature. This is my one feature request for LinkedIn. If anyone in the room happens to work there, please file this internally for me. Mark a question is unread, right? If you figured out how to address that, your impact would have been enabling people to decrease missed messages, decrease frustration with Zoe, <laughs> decrease anger that people feel when they miss these things, uh, increase number of deals made, all of these things, right? Did you do it yet? No, but that's what you enabled and you understand why that feature existed versus like, oh, I just made it and it looks kind of cool. James, what do we got? We have some academics in the house and there are a handful of questions that are Love it. getting very popular. So Eureka is asking if I come from academia and have been doing multiple projects, would it make sense to break things out by project by project as opposed to job? Yeah, so this is totally gonna depend person to person. Uh, I think within a portfolio, definitely um, go within a project. Within academia, really the thing I call out is the thing that we traditionally think of impact in academia, like writing a paper is not impact in tech. Uh, so don't tell me that you wrote a paper, tell me what the impact of writing that paper was. If somebody cited your paper and that paper was in nature, you just enabled the paper in nature, right? That's a pretty big leap, but think broadly in these senses. If you wrote a paper on farmers and uh, crop rotation, and you can see that that was actually adopted by a couple of farmers, you can take credit for the amount of CO2 that they uh, didn't release because they properly rotated their crops um, or, or, or re reduction in, in pesticides or whatever else. So it is taking credit further down the line. Now, if let's say you've been in academia for a while, you might want to call out just one or two projects. Um, why it can give you a little bit of a summary. Hey, this, this is why I did this work. And then here's two or three impacts from it. But you're still limited. I still really wouldn't go over like five, maybe six lines within each job. Um, the piece of this to consider is I don't need to know the entire project. Again, I just need to have the hook. I just need to have enough to determine that you understood why you did your research and what came of it. So don't feel like you have to explain every single project all the way through. Right on. And as a follow up, Kelly's asking specifically, should you list your publications? So I still would. Um, <laughs> but if you're going to list them, don't list them either. Don't list them in the line by line of the job description. I see this sometimes where somebody will have a publication section and then in each job as well, they'll like, and I published a paper. You've already told me that in another part of the resume. So don't tell me that twice. Um, especially if they're UX publications, it's worth it to keep it on there. There are certain companies that do really enjoy that still. Um, Google and Microsoft stand out as tend to care about publications. It does vary team to team, but it's something that they still like. Um, if you're going to mention the publication in line within the job, though, it does need to compact, connect to an impact of that publication. The publication itself is not enough. But if it's just at the end of the resume, here's a list of my pubs, totally fine. Cool. Alex is asking, would a PhD help your resume to stand out when applying for UXR positions? And if yes, how? If you don't already have one, I would say no. Don't go get a PhD for the sake of getting a UXR position. If only because you're going to spend three to five years making $22,000 a year max while you hope to get a job that pays really well. Um, I don't know outside of the US, but like starting salaries for UXR, like 117 to 135 at some of the larger companies. And then you have stock on top of that, which means you have five years in which you could have made $500,000 as a lower to come in one step higher. Uh, that's not a good economic trade-off. If you love academics and you love having a PhD, please go get a PhD. 
Um, it will help you stand out a little bit. It's just not, if, if it's purely to stand out, it's not worth it. Um, that PhD should be related to UX specifically. Um, I have a master's in something that has absolutely nothing to do with UX. Google didn't give two poops about my master's. Lyft actually did. So that's also going to vary between companies. Um, yeah, if you love academia, please don't let traditional markers of success, like getting a great job or, or income, affect your willingness to get it. If your goal in getting it is just to get the goal, the job in UX, don't don't do it. Don't don't do it at all. You cry a lot in a PhD program too, which also kind of sucks. Thanks for that perspective. We've got a really great question from Eureka, and it's kind of about the journey of your resume and when you apply. So the question is, who actually reads resumes when I apply through a portal? I'm wondering yeah. what goes into it. Is there an algorithm for that applicant tracking system? And does that check for length or for keywords? Because sometimes I am skeptical of how much tailoring a resume can impact whether an interview is extended. I understand how important impact statements are in general, but I guess I'm skeptical that my resume alone will get me through the door. So the resume gets you just into the recruiter, right? And the recruiter decides who make it through, who makes it through that door. Um, I don't know how common ATS is within UX. I know Airbnb does not use it. I know Lyft does not use it. Um, I presume some of the larger companies do. I don't know is the real answer there. Um, you can always have two resumes if you really are worried about it. Um, people that apply for government jobs do this. They submit like 12 page resumes um, that like just are laden with keywords. If you know anyone that works in government, there's some of the most horrible, horrible but hilarious resumes you'll ever read. Uh, but I think fewer companies use ATS than you realize. And the way to get around that is just to find the recruiter on LinkedIn and reach out to them there. Great. We've got a question from Jaya Thircha. I've been a marketer slash writer all my career. Is UXR the right career pivot for me? Will marketing examples in my resume be relevant to display in a UXR resume or portfolio? Only you can decide if it's the right zag for you. Um, I love it. I love what I do. Uh, but it's only up to you. I will say, yes, marketing is very easy to talk about in a UX research transition because you're doing a lot of the same thing. You're figuring out what resonates with your user to get them to click buy. Um, you're doing a lot of the same stuff in research. Cool. James, I'm looking at the time and it went by much faster than I thought. So let's jump into this next one and then keep going through the breakout rooms. Yeah, sounds like a plan. And to anyone who we haven't got to, rest assured, we've logged all your questions. And if we can't get to it, you have Zoe's contact info as well. So. so impact statements should be pretty darn simple. Um, I call this the duck method. I think actually there's a couple of people in the room that I've mentored in the past and they're familiar with the duck method. Um, oh, I thought maybe I had a duck slide, there we go. What is the duck method? You should be able to convince a pretty smart duck, right? He's made good money. This but pretty smart duck that you were impactful. He's still a duck. He still can't use technology very well. So it should be so straightforward that even this semi-smart duck could understand it. They're clear indicators of impact and they're showing me that you understand that bridge. That's all they're doing. It is not a list of skills, right? These are really boring. These are hard to read. I don't know that you were any good at it. I don't know that anybody adopted the work that you said. And they don't even tell me that you can do the skill all that well. The example I use here all the time is a contractor, right? If you were gonna hire someone to rebuild a house or to build a house for you and, you, and they said, well, I can hammer and use a saw. You're gonna be like, great. Like those are definitely skills that a contractor needs, but it's not enough to hire them, right? You wanna know, are they gonna deliver you the house on the left that's made almost completely of plywood or are they gonna deliver you this beautiful modern wonder, right? You're gonna look at their impact. You're gonna look at the houses that they built in the past and how well those have stood up, how satisfied are the people within them. You're not just gonna make sure they can hammer. You can have skills on a resume, right? Toss them in their own section. 
Um, I love skills section. I love tools section. There are people that disagree with this. I love them. Most of the people I work with are, love them because they're a great way for us to just glance and say, okay, they say they've got it. I will call out one caveat here. Google loves to lean into these sections and they will throw someone in your interview loop who is the leading expert on prototyping, on user stories, and they will drill you on the basics of that method. So for Google, only include the ones that you are very, very good at. Um, for everybody else, throw in everything, throw in all your tools. Uh, separate tools from skills just so that they're easier to read and design from research if you do both. But they should not be in each section. Each section of like what you did, this freelance, working at Trill, that should just be about impact. What does that look like? My favorite formula for this is accomplish X as measured by Y by doing Z. We went through a couple of examples of these earlier, but that's impact, proof, method. This is the bridge. A couple of quick examples, increased reservations by 11.1% through identification of issues with perk recall. This is the one I mentioned to you earlier. So this is all complicated and fun. So what we're going to do now is try it. <laughs> I didn't edit this deck. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, James. James did, and the team designed a beautiful pre pre uh, presentation. So imagine a very beautiful worksheet is right here. Um, what I've put together for you is a bunch of things that I have gotten in resumes um, that get sent to me. I used to review a whole bunch of resumes. I'm going to have you make impact statements about these, right? Some of these have almost no information in them. So make it up. It can be anything. No one's, nobody knows, right? If they feel like there's too much information, if it's too long, focus on the best stuff, cut stuff out. Not everything needs to make it through. Again, short, simple, it should appeal to the very smart duck. If you're confused, if you're having a hard time with it, please try anyway. We are not gonna make you read them all out. We are gonna ask people to participate, but just give it a shot. These, the only way to do these is to try. Um, so try. Four rules, keep it simple. Connect impact to outcome. That's your bridge. Use measurable proof when possible. For the sake of this, you can make it up or you can try some of the methods we talked about for keeping it broader. And please, please, please don't be afraid to brag, right? If your pebble was thrown into the pool and 90 ripple whips the way it hit a fish and that fish was caught by a fisherman, you get to take credit for catching the fish, okay? So I'm gonna leave this on the screen. And James, have you sent out the link? There we have, yes. Please click on that Google Drive link for your very own copy of the Impact Exercises Workbook. Love it. So take 10 minutes and then we'll regroup. Okay, James, should we bring everyone back? Sounds good. Okay, so we'll dive into a couple of these. There's a ton in these workbooks just to get you thinking, playing. Um, so, and huge thanks to the folks over at SDXD who designed this because my version of it was not pretty. Awesome, okay. Let's take this first one. Manage and develop the team's contract UX PGM or program manager by helping them to set up and socialize new processes that enable research and design efforts. Who wants to jump in? Quick reminder, people who jump in get an opportunity or entered into an opportunity to meet with me one-on-one -on -one for an hour. How, why, how might we fix this one? Um, I have one I'd like to share. Uh, it's enabled research and design efforts for the team's contract UXP GM by setting up and socializing processes. Okay. Repeat the first part for me. Enabled research and design efforts for the team's contract UXP GM. I love where this is getting. 
Um, I love that you, you're thinking about kind of like, how is it getting through the process? I think we can be a little bit more specific. And in terms of shortening, it probably doesn't matter the role. This is me throwing in needless information. Uh, contract versus FTE. Uh, this is also probably one that I should have clarified. Uh, within major companies, we have FTEs, which are called full-time employees, which means that if you work at Google, you are paid by Google. If you are a contractor, uh, which is really common, you might work at Google or work for Google, but be paid by a deco or some other stand-in company, and then you're considered a contractor. Um, but love where this is going, because does anybody want to take it to the next step? Autumn okay. sent me a direct message, so you're welcome to, to unmute yourself. Okay, Tessa dropped in. Increase the capabilities of R&D efforts by 15% over six months by implementing more e efficient contracting processes. I really like this. Um, I don't know that it's the same, but I really like it. And she made stuff up, which is what we said, so I love it. Um, what do I like about this? Increase the capabilities, right? We're being really clear about what that outcome was, right? We gave them more that they could do. Um, there's a direct measurement here. And how did she do it? Implementing more efficient contracting processes. Nice work, Tessa. I really like where this is heading as well. Okay, let's go to this next one because this next one's really broad. Led an evangelized accessibility design to improve any company that you'd like, products for all users. Okay, uh, I don't wanna mess up your name. Increased user engagement by 13% across all company products through strongly advocating for accessibility design. Um, I really like this, uh, increased user engagement. I, we are defaulting to percentages, which are the easiest. Um, these are great, but you don't have to have them. Um, yeah, to Karen's point. So let's take this one, increased user engagement by 13%. You could actually leave that as increased user engagement across all company products. That itself is a measurement, right? It's across multiple different products. That's the scale. Um, you could even name a couple of them, right? If you knew that it affected Nest, uh, Home, and uh, YouTube across these three Google products. Um, people are jumping in. I'm losing track of where this is. Um, strongly advocating for accessibility design. There's probably a little bit more specifics that we can get into there, like one or two very specific things that you did, which might be uh, giving a talk, um, holding executives accountable, some research funding and things of that nature. But that's really, really great. Uh, expand to the potential market of company by this, by leading and evangelizing accessibility design. I actually really like the start of this, the expanded the, the potential market. Um, and this is especially great for students, right? Because you're not actually taking credit and saying I did it, but you made it possible. You enabled it in a way that's really clear, which if it's a student led project and you just don't know if they used it or not, or if it's an internship that you then had to leave, this is a great way to do it. Carolyn, I really like that. Um, with the leading and evangelizing, we can probably shorten that down. Um, leading design sprints, again, being a little bit more specific so that this is your opportunity to show off those methods that you are more tempted to share, those skills, and having them connect to that impact. So the skills themselves are great, methods are great, just connect them to impact. Um, except, expanded the ability of 10,000 more users with various sensory disabilities to use company's product by evangelizing. The first half of this I really like. Um, quantified it in terms of users. What do I like about this? Uh, Eureka didn't actually have to take that from her own user base. She could have gone online and said, what percentage of Americans use YouTube? It's this many. What percentage of Americans have visual disabilities? And gotten a number from that, right? Because it did increase that in expandable market. It didn't have to be made yet. It didn't have to have impact yet because she made that possible. That's a really, really great example of different ways to think about impact outside of the traditional roles of getting some sort of hard data from what you've got. Um, second half, the same. I think this word evangelized is just sexy and people like it. Please move away from evangelized. Um, this one led an evangelized accessibility. So we started with what we did 
instead of starting with impact. It is best to start with the impact because as people scan through, you want them to get the meat first, right? Get that really important stuff and then go through it. What I do like in this one that ensuring all UI elements and colors met these specific standards, that's a good way to show off a method um, which improved readability. I would flip this on its head and say improved readability through these UI elements. Just lead with that impact. Um, this one increased user engagement by 50% by improving design accessibility. Very straightforward, very simple. Um, I think it works. Okay. Here's what we get into our longer ones. Supervised quantitative large scale longitudinal research projects that brought me, God, this was so hard to read the first time too, brought in a significant share of annual revenue. The sample included 10,000 respondents in 40 different cities, interviewed twice a year using CATI. Reports contain NPS, SWOT, brand equity, brand image, and brand health pyramid. Thank you, Rick. I know we're running over, but if anybody can stay, please stay. Ah, oh, okay. I love this. Increase the annual revenue by a significant share by supervising, right? What did you do? You got rid of a lot of this fluff. Oh, that was a direct message. I'll read this out. This person said, I increased the annual revenue by a significant share by supervising a large scale quantitative research. So much of what's in this one is really not important, right? The number of respondents, actually not important. Why? You're putting yourself at methodological risk. Sometimes I'll read resumes and somebody will say, I did a survey with 90 people. I'm not gonna look at your resume beyond that point because 90 is not stat sig. And now I know that you don't know that. Or if you do know that, that you don't know enough to call it out, right? So I'm not going to read the rest of the resume, even if it was an amazing resume. So just don't include the number of respondents because you're only putting it yourself at risk and you're really not helping anything. Similar to 40 different cities, interviewed twice a year, all of these pieces are just not important to the impact. You could break each of these apart. You might focus just on the cities. What's the impact of cities? You might, if it's global, you might be doing a better job of making it accessible to all your users. This is huge for Google that is really big in obviously traditional European and American countries, but also in India. So how do you make sure it works in both? Um, but that would be its own piece of impact, right? Uh, the annual resume is its own piece of impact. Okay, supervised large scale quantitative research project that contributed 44% of total annual revenue. So this, this one we could still work on a little bit. The, what we, we still wanna start with the impact, right? So contributed 44% of total annual revenue, love that, lead with that through supervision of large scale quant research projects. The second piece, this was me trying to trick you, um, that included NPS SWOT analysis, everything else does not need to be here. This is the same as hiring a contractor who hammers and drills, really not that interesting. Drop those into the skills section. You don't need to connect them specifically to this piece. Um, increased product revenue by 10% through biannual execution of longitudinal research project. Brittany, I love it, amazing. Okay, next one to keep on time. Well, we're not on time, but to keep going. Launched a full research and design program to guide product shifts to make a company a more equitable platform. Who's got something for me? Led company strategy evolution to becoming a more equitable platform by establishing new research and design program. Works, simple, to the point. Um, Facilitated product changes that made the company more equitable platform by launching a full service. Again, lead with the impact. Start with that the second half of that statement and you're good to go. Andrea, you mentioned not to include small sample size which show lack of awareness of stat sig. Would that be the same rule of thumb in case studies and portfolios? Um, yes, to specifically in resumes. Um, and in, if you're talking about the method in the portfolio. It's okay in a portfolio. If you really, you just could only get 40 people, don't talk about it for a survey. Obviously for quanti for qualitative work, you know, five, six is actually could have been a reasonable number depending on the product. So it's just not as important. Anytime that you're mentioning a sample size, there should be a reason for it, right? I don't just wanna know you did 10,000 for the sake of it. 
you should only mention 10,000 if it's part of impact. Um, similarly for the portfolio, if you interviewed 200 people, I wanna know why you needed to interview that many people or what the other limitations were. Does that answer your question, Andrea? Great. And I, be wary, like, <laughs> I did once talk to someone and, and they were like, oh, I had 500 people. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, okay, stat sig. And then they said they only, and 90% of people wanted to volunteer more. So we told the client that they should email people more, but they emailed like 50,000 people and only that many people responded. And I was like, do you think there's potentially bias that the people that responded were more interested in volunteering? So just tell me where the biases are is a big piece of that. and academically important. Um, Carolyn, love this question. Different methods have different sample sizes. Um, if it's 30, you're probably just doing a qualitative survey. So just call out that it's a qualitative survey. Um, also, if your whole population is 30, obviously this doesn't apply. If you only, if there's only 30 researchers of this specific thing and you surveyed all of them, that, that still makes sense. Uh, okay. Sarah, facilitated org-wide shift towards a more equitable platform as evidence. Oh, I love this. This is great. This is really, really great. Perfect. Okay, number five, developed five wireframes to explore design solutions. Successfully explore design solutions leading to their implementation through development. I want you guys to make up some stuff for this one. Maria, the second half of this leading to implementation that's the impact. That's the cool. That's the sexy that I want you to push on. So um, start with that piece of it. Farley integrated surface customer needs from interviews with 12 users to explore order tracking design solutions by developing five wireframes. The 12 and the five just aren't all that important. So I would remove those to make it a little bit easier to read. Um, and I still want to know the impact. What was the impact of integrating surface customer needs? Did that make it easier? Did that uh, make it quicker to launch? Uh, did that overcome frustration with your team? Gain consensus more quickly? All sorts of things like that, those can be impact. Thanks, Carolyn. Okay, let's go through one more of these. If James is still. James, you wanna roll the number six? Um, synthesized interview results into a journey map, identifying 21 separate user actions, providing 10 concrete suggestions for adding value to a website. Let's take two on this one. Did we lose everyone? We might have lost everyone. Okay, so the piece of this, the 21 is a, is a, tra a trap as is the 10. What did making that journey map do for your team? That's what I wanna see. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle, <laughs> I appreciate you. Tell me what the outcome of the journey map was, right? Did that create consensus? Did that give your team, did that help determine your OKR, organizational key results or, OK, or, or metrics? Um, what can you push on to help them get to that next level? Okay, let's go back to questions live. 